began the day I brought Flight 59 into Kansas City from New York. It was a routine flight, and after we secured, I left the plane with my crew. Oh, by the way, my name's Edwards, Bill Edwards, and that's me walking on the right. I went to the ready room with Danny Bow, my co-pilot, to pick up my mail. Most of it was bells and ads, but one letter interested me. It came from a guy I'd never heard of. I was in a hurry and didn't open it, figuring I'd read it later. I didn't get to it until that night, just as my wife Patty was putting the kids to bed. Good night. Well, a letter gave me quite a surprise. You don't expect letters like this when you're an airline pilot. I waited for Patty to come down so that I could read it to her. Guess what, darling? A passenger wrote me a fan letter. First one I ever got. Well, you better answer it. Maybe the young lady's going to start a fan club. <laughs> George, you're right. Maybe she will. A very sound idea. You mean you aren't going to read it? Read it? Now? Oh, no. Bill Edward, you read that letter. After uh, all, I'm... Uh... Simmer down. Captain William Edwards, transfer our territory to Kansas City, there, dear Captain Edwards. Sure you want to hear the rest of this? We've never met, so I'll identify myself. My name is John B. Simmons. I flew your airline from Los Angeles to New York last week. You were my pilot on the second leg, Kansas City East. And whether you like it or not, this is a fan letter, my first. You see, Edwards, for my dope, pilots are the airline. Everybody else just sits on the bench and cheers. Now, I don't know whether you remember the Kansas City, New York hop, but here's the way I saw it from my seat. The hostess told us our altitude was 19,000 feet, speed 315. But that newspaper I bought in Kansas City said the weather in the east was generally bad. I could see out the window that it was all below us. That's what I like, but you're over the weather flying. I saw you only once during the flight, and you didn't seem to be worrying about any weather. Another thing, you're about my age. I thought the young fly boys put you old geezers, you're 37 anyhow, out of business. When that light went on about seat belts and smoking, I began to wonder how you were doing up forward. After all, we hadn't seen the ground since we left Kansas City, and coming into New York isn't exactly like landing at Squeedown. Anyhow, you brought her down, right through the stuff. A couple of times, it couldn't even see the wingtips. that I were up front, behind the scenes, where you really see what's going on. Well, we came through, and there was supposed to be. Not only that, but when we reached LaGuardia, the overcast began to break up, and the sun was out. I thought that was kind of appropriate, and so did your landing, not even a bump. You know, Cap, I ride the airlines a lot, and I always wondered why, after a performance like that, you fellows don't come back and take a bow. You'd be surprised at a few applause you might get. Wouldn't be for doing something special, mind you, but for doing so well what I'm sure you'll dismiss as routine. Well, I wish.
waited for you, but of course, you didn't take your curtain call. You fellas never do. So I put my applause into this letter, Edwards. It's my way of saying thanks for a job well done. Sincerely, John B. Simmons. That's a nice letter, Bill. Awfully nice. Yes, nice, but it's all wrong. Wrong? Yes, it's wrong. Pilots are the airline. Everyone else sits back and cheers. Well, don't they, dear? Oh. Oh, come now, Bill. You're not going to be modest about this. No, not modest. Just truthful. You know, I'm going to answer that letter, Patty. Maybe I can make one fellow understand what really makes an airline run. That won't be a letter, my friend. That's going to be a novel. Well, go ahead anyway. I've got a few thousand dull things to do upstairs. Seriously, though, Bill, I'd like to read it before you send it off. Oh, you'd better come down here, then. It'll be too heavy to carry upstairs. <laughs> sound unappreciative when I tell you that you've sent it to the wrong guy, a pilot. Actually, sir, I'm just one man on a team, and instead of bench warmers, I've got a lot of blockers and signal callers helping me along. I remember your flight, and I'd like to tell you a few things about it, and about this whole business of making an airline tick. Maybe it'll help explain what I mean. First, about Transworld, the airline I work for. We fly from the Pacific Coast to Bombay, 32,000 miles. We hit four continents, 60 cities here, and 17 countries overseas. The planes we fly are those of a pioneering outfit. We were first to run coast-to-coast -coast scheduled service, first in over-weather flying, pioneers in de-icers, automatic pilots, and radar. I can go on, but that'll give you an idea. Running this airline takes a whale of a lot of teamwork and coordination. Take your flight. First, you picked up your phone and ordered your ticket. Took you all of two and a half minutes. Here's how. You talk directly to our district reservations office. Here the agent received your order and at a glance was able to confirm that the flight you wanted was open and sell you a ticket. Your order was sent to the message center and immediately teletyped to our reservation service center in Kansas City. Ticket sold on the line goes here, giving us a complete traffic picture at all times. Ten minutes after you bought your ticket, by phone in Los Angeles, the name John B. Simmons was entered on the flight listing in Kansas City, and you were all set. A couple of days later, you picked up your ticket at our office in downtown Los Angeles. That didn't take long either with your air travel card, maybe another two and a half minutes. I've gone into detail about this because so few passengers realize how many people are involved in making ticket buying the famous business that it is. Then your departure day, you arrived at the airport to check in. Our agent called district reservations to check your space, and before you knew it, you had been officially received. You could forget about your baggage. It would be there when you arrive at your destination. It takes a smooth working team to make your trip comfortable and pleasant, to arrange for everything, from meals to magazines. Your airplane was ready just a few steps away, and all you had to do was get aboard. TWA flight two, constellation service. Well, they called your flight, and there she was. I don't know about you, Mr. Simmons, but every time I see that Connie, I get a fresh boot out of her. They build her at Lockheed Aircraft in Burbank, California, using the engineering and production techniques that have made us the greatest air power in the world. 
Each constellation costs us one million dollars. And once you've seen her come together at Lockheed, you know why. She winds up 10 feet longer than a Pullman car, with a wingspan longer than the distance of the Wright brothers' first flight, with horsepower equal to that of four fair-sized locomotives. Yet she weighs no more than a locomotive's wheels. When she's finished, we pilots think we've got the slickest ship in the air. Before we ever see her, she's put through a series of exhaustive tests. Every part of her, from nose to tail, gets this treatment. The reason is a word we live by in the airline business. That word is safety. Well, that's the story of your airplane, Mr. Simmons. Now to get back to your flight. You got off on schedule and headed for Kansas City, five hours and ten minutes away. pilot was Jimmy Dew, an old buddy of mine. A couple of hours out, you had luncheon. Beef consomme, veal supreme, Dutch's potatoes, mixed fresh vegetables, hearts of lettuce with dressing, nut meringue and coffee. Which brings up the food story, one we're pretty proud of. We've done a lot of pioneering here, too. In our Kansas City test kitchen, we're always working on recipes, procedures, and equipment giving food for thought to food for flying. Although we have six food units around the country from which plane service is delivered, our production kitchen in Kansas City cooks all the meats, potatoes, and desserts for the line. 75% of the food used in our coast-to-coast -coast feeding is prepared here. Five tons of food a week, two and a half million meals a year. Freezing is the whole story. We don't freeze raw food, but cooked meals. First in pre-cool to lose body heat, then in blast 50 below, finally in hold 10 below. These frozen meals, as needed, are shipped by air to the outlying six food units. Each unit restores its own food in special ovens. Freezing enables us to prepare our food well in advance. A meal may be three months old when restored, yet it's as tasty as the day it was cooked. Things like salads and beverages, of course, are prepared at each of the six food units. Some really neat and efficient containers have been designed for food and drink. Light in weight, that's essential, but sturdy as well as compact. In other words, built for flying. When the plane lands, one of the first things we do is to remove the used service and put in the fresh service, whether it be another meal, a snack, or simply a beverage. Simmons, with your meal over, you had a chance to look at the scenery. You get a lot of it on that Los Angeles to Kansas City run, particularly that stretch over the Grand Canyon. You know it cost the company $32,000 to train a Connie crew, $15,000 for the captain alone, quite a sum. And that brings up another story, the training story. 
In Kansas City, we run a regular school for captains, first officers, and flight engineers. We not only teach new personnel how to fly for us, but keep our old employees abreast of new developments that are always popping up in aviation. take three physicals a year, two government, one company, and this constant checking up goes for training too. Once you're on the line, it never stops. Every six months we get an instrument check, blind flying, and there are regular line checks. Our pilots have logged a million hours, Mr. Simmons, but these standards are never relaxed. I'm 38, you missed by a year, have 18,000 hours in the log, started with the line as a co-pilot of the Ford Tri-Motor in 1933. Co-pilot Danny Bell signed on three years ago. He's going to make a fine captain one day. We call Andy Dean, our flight engineer, Gadget, but he's really an accomplished licensed mechanic. Barbara McCann and Jane Phillips are graduates of a fine host school. Two good gals. So much for us, Mr. Simmons. Now, while you were sleeping at 19,000 feet, here's what we were doing on the ground at Kansas City. First thing Danny and I did was to check in at flight control, the operations boys. We talked over New York weather, ceiling 800 with a chance, but only a chance, of lifting. Gas load and the thousand and one details that go into making ready for takeoff. On the average, we have 57 flights in the air every hour of the day and these boys are watching them all. Next, meteorology. Our company was the first to employ staff meteorologists, and we listen to what they say every time we fly. The chief gave us the picture, a picture he gets from the government, our old forecasters, and our planes aloft. The weather was pretty punk across the central and eastern states at low altitude. At 19,000 feet, though, we could ride over the cloud tops in smooth air and sunshine, and we bought that right away. Danny had all the dope, and I left him to his bookkeeping, and went next door to see Bill Chappell, a friend of mine in flight planning. These boys worry about the economic end of the business. Things like available loads, mail, passengers, express and food. In short, they see that the airline runs smoothly, as an airline must. Meanwhile, Danny was hard at it. I had ordered 4,000 gallons of gas, enough to fly from Kansas City to New York and back again. We burn about a gallon a mile, five gallons a minute. I was still talking with Bill when your flight came in from the coast. And right on time, I might say. Right then, a lot of people got busy. Ever watch a ready plane, Mr. Simmons? Quite an operation. A weight and balance operation. First, weight. A Connie can take off at 96,000 pounds, land at 83,000. The ship will burn so much gas on a flight. Weight six pounds per gallon. The number of pounds, if you will, of gasoline to be consumed is all important. We have a weight and balance man in our ramp office who figures everything before takeoff, even the weight of the crackers for the soup. As for balance, your mail, express, air freight, and baggage must be distributed just right. I went 
back to the ready room to wait for Jimmy Duke. We always chew over the first leg of the flight with the incoming pilot. And although I guess we talk a pretty special language, I can sum up what Jim said in a short sentence. Routine flight, airplane perfect. Meanwhile, Andy Dean, our flight engineer, checked over the airplane. This is standard procedure. He's not only trained to do the job, but it's good practice to have it done by a man who's going to ride the airplane. These fellows are like doctors. They know where to look. And this checkup takes place every time one of our planes gets ready for departure. is more than an airport job with us. At our overhaul base in Kansas City, Kansas, maintenance never stops. Every time one of our planes flies 1,300 hours, we bring her in and replace her engines. And every 10,000 hours, we give her something called an OP-7, which means we just about tear the whole ship apart and rebuild her. I wish you and all the other people who fly regularly could see an OP-7 because it represents the kind of attention a scheduled airline like ours gives us. The first thing we do to a Connie when she comes in is to remove her engines and tear them down, piece by piece. the thousands of parts is then given an eight-hour cleaning and a chemical wash. Next, each part is literally x-rayed to see if there are any imperfections. Then, hand inspected against rigid tolerances. Some of the parts are okay, good as new. Others may require reconditioning in our shops. Still others may be replaced. When the engine is reassembled, however, every part measures up. It's really a new engine. trained inspector, the newly assembled engine is run for six hours on a test stand. The Connie gets an interior decoration job in her upholstery shop. They also replace any fabric covered surfaces that need attention. Meanwhile, our sheet metal shop handles any work on the skin of the ship. The base tests the airplane's radio equipment, every tube of it. It also rips out her entire electrical system and rebuilds it. Her instruments get a ride on an oscillating test machine, which goes through the most severe maneuvers an airplane could be subjected to. But we rebuff and inspect the Connie's props, too. Every 3,000 hours, she gets a new set. The balance of these blades is so perfect, Mr. Simmons, that believe it or not, the weight of a paper matchbox will make them revolve. Continuing maintenance means that a job like this, an OP-7, which takes 4,500 man-hours, can be done in six days simply because we have a constant stream of replacement parts going through the base. Last thing we do is weigh the ship. They must stay within one half of one percent of their original weight.
Well, it's nice to know you've got that kind of a plane under you, and we try to do right by her. Now for the flight itself. Kansas City Ground Control, TWA Flight 2. Request taxi clearance, IFR New York. TWA, flight two, runway one seven, wind south, variable five to ten, north on taxi strip. You remember we taxied past the tower. These boys are the traffic cops at the airport. They work with Air Route Traffic Control, the government's traffic cop of the airways. They clear my flight plan and keep checking my progress all along the line. We moved out to the warm-up block. I suppose you've wondered why there's always a delay before takeoff. Here's what's going on up front. Look, skate compass. Direction. Vacuum. Check to the forest. Directional gyros. Set up case. Trim tab. Set. Take off flap. Take off flap. Speed on heater. Check heater. Control services. Free full travel. Engine estimate. Normal. Generator. On. Carburetor air. Cold. Propeller. Pulling the cream. Mixture. Rich. Hill pumps. On high. Airplane. Ready. Kansas City Tower. TWA Flight 2. Ready for takeoff. TWA 2. Clear for takeoff. we knew where we were all the way. First, we were on the beam, kept getting its signal. Second, automatic direction finder. The airway is marked with radio signposts. As we pass over each one, the needle swing from dead ahead to astern. And our third check, a marker light flashes on. Flight two, Columbia 03, 19,000 visual on top, St. Louis 25. And that's the way it went all the way, 1,100 air miles. Flight 2, St. Louis, 25, Indianapolis, 10. Midway between points, we tune in on the station ahead and ride in and out of that range. Flight 2, Indianapolis, 10, Columbus, 47, 47. Flight 2, Columbus, 46. Pittsburgh, 17-1-7. Flight 2, Pittsburgh, 18, Allentown, 11-1-1. Flight 2, Allentown, 11, LaGuardia, 35-45. At the Flatbush fan marker, we picked up ILS, instrument landing system. Two radio beams indicating direction and glide slope. As we progressed along the ILS, radio markers gave us the distance from the field. Then, by keeping the cross pointers at right angles, we held the plane right on the beam. 
and the beam brought us straight and true right into our landing. to meet you personally, but I expect I will one of these days. You said you were our regular. In closing, let me say to you, one of our two million passengers, thanks a lot from me, just one guy among 12,000 people who run the